Thank you for being here with us tonight. Buonasera, benvenuti to Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. My name is Stefano Albertini. I'm the director of the Casa. And I'm delighted that this series that started almost by chance is um, becoming a tradition, a well-loved tradition of the Casa. Uh, as you know, Forgotten Gems uh, is part of Le Conversazioni. There is a larger uh, series of cultural events that goes from Capri, Rome, uh, they did Bogota, Paris now, and, and many more. And the idea is to talk about books especially, but also, as it is the case here at the Casa, also to talk about films. The soul and the founder of Le Conversazioni, along with David Azzolini in Naples, is our friend Antonio Monda. He's a professor of cinema here at the uh, Department of Film and Television of the Tisch School of the Arts. He's also a member of the board of Casa Italiana. He's a regular contributor to the major Italian newspapers when it comes especially to cultural issues. Uh, the New York Times defined him in an article, uh, the most active cultural institution. I mean, he became an institution. He is an institution. And we are delighted that he's part of our own institution. And uh, thanks to Antonio, we have the fortune of having great guests like we have uh, tonight when we have uh, Molly Haskell. And I normally don't do formal introduction of, uh, of guests because it's, I leave it to Antonio and he normally does it as we go, as we proceed. There are full biographies of both Antonio and Molly on our website and I warmly invite you to uh, check them out. Some of you might have seen that in our social media we started a sort of a, of a quiz since they do not reveal the titles of the three gems for each until the time comes on the stage. But we gave a few hints and I don't know whether some of you tried to guess which the films are. Maybe Antonio will lead us into that. And without further ado, please welcome Molly Hasco and Antonio Monda. Molly Haskell is an extraordinary film critic and film historian. I like uh, sometimes to disagree with her because especially when I disagree, I always learn something. And I know that I will learn tonight. Um, we have chosen three films each. It's a rich program, so I would start with the first clip. It's a film that uh, uh, Molly uh, has chosen. It is based on a Guy de Maupassant uh, collection of uh, uh, short stories. Let's watch it. I will just say that the film is by Max Ophuls, of course, 1952. In America, it was called House of Pleasure, Le Plaisir. Why yeah. this film? Well, Max Ophuls, the great German director, he made films in France and Germany before coming to America in the 40s. And he was the great romantic. His films were about love and passion and romance, but always with a kind of undertone of, of, of mortality, and so I chose this because there are three, it's part of it's the first of three triptychs, the three tr three short stories, and I just felt this scene was number one, just such bravura filmmaking. Ophuls was known for his long tracking shots, the mirrors, the gaiety. Um, in fact, he's he's influenced a lot of other directors, but we might get to that. And you had this man suddenly, this man coming in. At first, he does look like a dandy, and then gradually, you see. Little by little, you see that it's sort of a, a death mask almost. Um, it's also, it, unlike, uh, Ophuls was a great director. In fact, Ophuls was a great director of women. In fact, all my th three of my choices are great directors of women, directors who love women but who also like them, which is not always the same. There are many directors who love women that don't always like them. And, but there was a balance between the men and women in this film. And there was usually... Um, a, a, a sort of a triangle and, 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 and equal sides here. The, the central one in here is one of the few sort of happier ones with uh, Jean Gabin and, um, <laughs> who is it? Uh, not Simone Signore, right? Daniel Darieux in the middle one, and then the final one. Um, one of the directors who was very influenced by Ophuls was Stanley Kubrick, who's really the antithesis of him on the emotional spectrum because. Ophuls was a great romantic, and there wasn't a romantic bone in Kubrick's body. <laughs> but he loved the tracking shots, and he said that Ophuls's camera could go through walls. And in fact, they do. In fact, the third story here, the camera actually does go through a wall as it follows this young artist model who goes up to leap to her death. It's a big Malian story, the third one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think he, there was another, uh, not this year, but Renoir also directed um, 
our film based on a de Maupassant story, uh, Un Parti de Campagne, and both, the two films are very different. I mean, R Renoir was also very different from Ophuls, but both of them, I think, I think there was something in de Maupassant that was kind of cynical at heart, and there's no cynicism in either of these directors, none. I mean, Ophuls is a pessimist, but never a cynic, and he's a romantic, but never, um, never sort of, uh, in, in, you know, he's, he's, he's tough, uh, underneath there's this core of toughness. And this, this scene just always, it just stays with me. I just find it, it's, um, there are other, I mean, there are other films that are more, that are more rounded and, and also in the end, and so you don't see the, the end of this, of his love story, which is that he has this poor wife, he's on his last leg, he doesn't actually die in this moment, he's stricken and he's taken home and you find, this poor wife who's been with him through thick and thin and just had to bear up with him all, all this time. So you, you do have a kind of uh, besides, sad ending. Besides Kubrick, do you see any other filmmaker who is influenced even today by... Well, you tell me because I know that both um, Todd Haynes has... He, actually, he's got a, he, he also loves this scene and he does something on Criterion where he shows this scene and Paul Thomas Anderson, but I mean... Uh, certainly their sensibility is very different, as it would be. I mean, there's something very kind of almost 19th century about Ophuls. And you mentioned the cynicism of Guy de Maupassant. When you talk about French literature, if you consider the canon of French, great French writers, mm -hmm. you immediately think of Proust, maybe Flaubert, Stendhal, mm -hmm. rarely of Maupassant. Yeah. But mm -hmm. among the French writers is the one who has been adapted m more often. Think of uh, Stagecoach is based on a Guy de Maupassant well, well, short story. Well, for one story. thing, the short stories, which always make better, I think, it lend themselves better to movie adaptations than novels. Yeah. And, but do you feel that Kubrick loved so much this film, and in particular Lola Montez, which is uh, Ophiuth's last film, yeah. only for the style, or there was something else? Well, I, 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 was, I watch, you know, he never gave interviews, but he gave this one. I was watching this, Michel Simon made a documentary about him. And in the course of it, I mean, he, he's always talking about technical things and, and what his procedure is when he, he always uses all the books. He never does an original screenplay. He's always using a, something in a book attracts him and he, and he bores into it and, and develops it in his own way. And in the end, um, I, I think we, we were talking about, I just watched Eyes Wide Shut and they were talking about that, the one with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman with it, this sort of weird, I mean, like the orgy, that, that's an example. <laughs> If you compare <laughs> Kubrick's orgy to the to the to the to the ball that's going on in No Fools, it's so dour, and everybody there's no really no sex in it. There's no there's no eroticism in it. There's no romance, and he talks about how he doesn't believe in romance. It's all sexual, and I think it's just. I mean, I think it's technical, really, because he he doesn't. Because oh, for the thing about Oh Fools with the track, here's the thing: with it's not just a virtuos, a virtu, uh, a matter of virtuosity. The track and shot has meaning. It means the, it's passage of time. You watch these people go. I mean, there's a long in every one of his films. It's usually a very meaningful, long, long um, tracking shot of people walking, eventually, probably to their doom. And it, it's really about people imprisoned in time. And and that's what you have here. You, I mean, this is the, sort of the conclusion of this, is this man is imprisoned in time. After all this movement, you come to the standstill. Because what I see in common between Kubrick and uh, uh, Ophuls is the connection between Eros and Thanatos, death and love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all his films are about dying somehow. Yeah, that's true. And you that's can feel also the same in often, yeah, often in yeah, Kubrick. Yeah, the underlying sense of mortality. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's Before true. I go to my first clip, I want to say, I don't know if you're familiar with the... Max Ophuls' real name. His real name was Maximilian Oppenheimer. Oh. And he changed it, nothing to do with, with the scientist. Mm. And he changed into Ophuls, which was a, an aristocrat family in Germany. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But like in, Joseph von Sternberg. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and von Sreim. Yeah. And, um, but um, in this country, when he started directing films, it was called Ophuls yeah. instead of Ophuls because it was too similar to Awful. So <laughs> they didn't want that name. <laughs> <laughs> and and of you he's the father of Marcelo Fools, who yes. made the sorrow and the pity. Yeah. yeah. And now let's watch my first choice. You mentioned Un Parti de Campagne by Jean Renoir. In that film, uh, the director that I picked was assistant director. This is the opening sequence of Ludwig by Luchino Visconti. A late Visconti is part of the so-called German trilogy. 
and it's one of his most desperate and bleak film. It's a portrait of the Ludwig II of, uh, of Baviera. How do you say Bavari? Bavaria? Bavaria. And uh, this is the moment where he is confessed by this priest before being crowned. And uh, to be honest, I rediscovered this film recently because I, I'm not a huge Visconti fan, with the exception, of course, of The Leopard and Rocco and his brothers. But uh, 20 years ago or so, I did a retrospective of Michael Cimino uh, at, the, at the Museum of Moving Image. And Cimino, in the conversation at the beginning of the, uh, the retrospective, told me and told the public, the audience, that his heroes, his trinity, he said, were Kurosawa, John Ford, and Visconti. And I was surprised. And I said, which Visconti film do you like better? And he said, Ludwig, because it's his self-portrait. It's about this king who love, loves art more than life. And of course, he's considered crazy. Probably he was crazy. It's a, a story about uh, a cursed, doomed character who is also a poet and a pure man in a, wor in a world where everybody is somehow corrupt. I think it, it's a film with a great performance by Helmut Berger, who is never a great actor, with the exception of this film. And it's so naked in his telling of the story. You can feel that is Visconti talking about his mortality. Once again, we go there. His art, in his fear, and also the fact that is uh, he, he came from a very privileged family. Not only was a duke, but his mother, Carla Erba, came from a, a very important pharmaceutical uh, com company. It wasn't uh, a family of industrial industrialists. Basically, he was an extremely wealthy man. And he started directing when he was 38, before he basically didn't do nothing. He just went to see horse racing and, and enjoy life, until uh, through a friend he met Renoir, and he discovered the pleasure of directing. He started with the <coughs> directing for the stage. And then he made an extraordinary film, Ossessione, followed by La Terra Trema and followed by all these great films. But I believe that in this film is the first time that it is completely, totally sincere. That's why I like it. It's not a perfect film, it's for long, four hours. It can be quite boring at times, but there are moments that I think never Visconti reached in all his career. Well, I, I, I think I may disagree with you, but since I haven't seen the restored version, I'm not in, quite entitled to do that. I saw the... Re, the a, a the three hours version. Yeah, I think, the three yeah. hour version, which still felt <laughs> the pretty The short long. version, the three hour. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think what you say is true, but it just felt... It's so in love with depravity. Oh, totally. You know, and it's totally. so self-indulgent and even self-pitying. Yeah. Um, and the Death in Venice came right before this, I think, and yeah. I didn't, that also was very much a less of Visconti. I recently saw one that, it's, uh, I think it was either right before or right after this conversation piece yes. with Burt Lancaster, and it's, it is short. That's also a self-portrait. It is, but it's, it's, uh, there's some, it has this, um, first of all, it's very short, so it has a modesty to it. He's a recluse, which I, I think Visconti almost basically was at that point. Yes, he was on a wheelchair. He, got, he, he had a, a strike at the end yeah. of this film, yeah. and then he could, couldn't direct. And basically, yeah. his last two films, uh, Conversation Piece and The Innocent, were camera piece, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, what he, I think he's so good, good with what he got out of Burt Lancaster here and in The Leopard are just yeah. extraordinary. And, and you, you know, he really and made you take Burt Lancaster uh, seriously. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, at the beginning, Visconti hated Lancaster because he right? wanted for The Leopard Laurence Olivier. Mm -hmm. And actually, he wanted also Laurence Olivier in this film for Wagner. And then uh, they cast Trevor, uh, Trevor, Howard, Trevor Howard. Really yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, but um, um, was uh, Goffredo Lombardi, the uh, Lombardo, the producer of The Leopard, who imposed Bar Lancaster. Mm -hmm. And for the first couple of weeks, Visconti didn't even talk to Lancaster. Mm -hmm. Then they become best friends. Mm -hmm. And actually, when uh, Visconti was preparing a conversation piece, there was no insurance who would, you know, mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, for Visconti, and uh, Lancaster put his own name and his own money. So, and I agree; it's uh, by far uh, the, yeah. the best performance. 
Uh, the other thing I've never understood is Visconti, as, as you say, was patrician, and he, he, he never got away from the, the patrician, the, the life of luxury. And, and all also that. a Marxist. And, and he calls himself a Marxist. So how does that work? I did never <laughs> Welcome to Italy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, I don't think he was never a Marxist. Yeah. But it was good to say at the time. It was what people yeah. were. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Let's go now back to America, I think, with your second choice. I just want to say that I love this film and I'm happy that you picked it. Yeah, well, it's a very, it's a, I think it's a wonderful, it's Robert Benton who started out as uh, one of the screenwriters on Bonnie and Clyde <clears throat> and made uh, <clears throat> Kramer versus Kramer, Places in the Heart. Um, this was made under the auspices of Robert Altman and Altman himself had a film, um, The Long Goodbye. It, both, both of them had this kind of vibe of the 40s gumshoe, you know, Hammett and Chandler. But what I, but this film to me is is a very unusual kind of mixed genre. I think of it as a screwball noir, um, <laughs> because Art Carney is this creaky guy, a loner. He doesn't want to be bothered. A d d detective. The first scene, he's you see the typewriter is something about he's r maybe writing his memoirs about guns and dames, and the doorbell rings and his his former sidekick is standing there and he says, well, come on in and. What, what's a, you know, wh where have you been? And the guy, he's got a gunshot in his back and he falls down dead. So you have this mixture of tones throughout. And the movie it really reminds me of is uh, Howard Hawks' His Girl Friday. And there's a scene I would have loved to show him, but it was just too long, where they're being chased or they're chasing the bad guys and Lily Tomlin is driving and she's terrified because they're, they're going through barriers and over landfills and... In the up and down, and finally they finish, and she gets, they get back. By this time, they're sort of at least talking to each other, and she says, "Oh, that." She's sort of full of her own confidence of having done this. That was this is the most fun I've ever had in my life, and she goes on and on, and it's like Cary Grant at the end of His Girl Friday. Catherine Hepburn has been driving him crazy throughout the whole film, and he's finally gotten away from her, and then she comes for some other purpose. And he said, that was just the best day I had in my whole life. <laughs> so you have these sort of insecure, I mean, Lily Tomlin is a hippy-dippy, new-age, spouting person, and yet you feel this deep insecurity underneath. But she's sort of boasting, and Carney just doesn't want to get anywhere near her, and gradually, of course, they come together. At some point, um, he's, he, the, the, it opens with her um, accosting him, or her friend accosting him, to find her cat. Her cat has been stolen, as emerges in that. And he just says, get away from me, you know. But fi finally he is doing it because he wants to get uh, avenge his sidekick. Um, but they do. And there's a kind of wonderful scene somewhere along the way towards the end. And he's fi finally, he, he said, I don't want to talk. She wants to talk. She wants a relationship, you know, the person who's dying for a relationship and the person who doesn't want any, any part of it. But they do sort of come to a kind of rapprochement. And he says, well, well couldn't you wear a goddamn dress for once, you know? <laughs> And uh, he and it was um, it was he was nominated. He won the I think the Oscar as best actor. No, the National Not, Society of Film yeah. Critics, and it was nominated for best. He won actor. the Oscar for Ar Ar Arian Tonto. That's right, and it was nominated. It was really an interesting year. Um, it was um, the Goodbye Girl, the Turning Point, Julia, this, and one other. I mean, these great. I mean, when when do we have such great films about women now. I mean, it's just astonishing. And I think Diane Keaton actually won that year. Um, what happened with Robert Benton? He made so many good films and all of a sudden... The Human Stain. I, yeah. I'm not even the sure. The Human I Stain mean, is not exactly a well, good he's film. Well, he's sort of a good friend, so I can't quite ask him <laughs> <laughs> what happened. But I think he just began writing. He, he's been writing his memoirs for a long time. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's just a question I can't answer. This film was um, written for Robert Altman, who produced the film. And maybe we feel that differently from the great Altman movies you mentioned, The Long Goodbye. Yeah. Um, in The Long Goodbye, you feel that they improvise a lot. Yeah. Here you see, you, you hear script. the script. It's scripted, it's absolutely. Very scripted. absolutely. And you mentioned yeah. Lily Tomlin, and she made five films with Altman. Mm. Uh, can you tell me something about her? What do you like about her? Um, well, she's basically a, a sort of stand-up person, stand-up performer. I like the, uh, I mean, it sounds strange, but the, the sort of Catherine Hepburn quality, that kind of abrasive and yet deeply shy Fine, yeah. person. 
Um, and you feel that in all the, in the, in the personas that she adopts. They're all sort of blabbermouths. And, um, and, she's, and she, has, she also has this sort of common touch, I think. I mean, which Catherine Hepburn didn't have, so she's not like her in that way. But there's this kind of bravura, and underneath it, this insecurity, this kind of yearning, I think. I totally agree. And she's still making a lot of That's right. she's yeah, still good it. comedies, yeah. and yeah. she's always funny. Let's go to the second choice, my second choice. That's a very controversial film. I want to anticipate this. This is the way this film starts. It's an epic. It's a tragedy. It's a Greek tragedy. Everybody dies in this film. Everybody. And, uh, but I want to say a few things about both this guy, Emilio Fernandez, and the director, Sam Peckinpah. Sam Peckinpah, in my opinion, has the same importance and value in cinema of the uh, Celine in literature, meaning a true artist who made horrible things. Mm. Uh, he was probably a terrible human being, but a true artist. I don't know if you agree with me. Yeah, the Celine analogy is really interesting. I think that. Uh, that thank yeah. you. Uh, mm, this is a film that made no money. It was hated by most of the critics, with the exception of Roger Ebert, who wrote, This is a bizarre masterpiece. And I agree. Mm. You never see Alfredo Garcia in the film because they cut his head two minutes after this scene. And it's all about Warren Oates, uh, Pekinpa, alter ego, who is escaping with the head chased by all the people from El Jefe. Um, first, I mentioned that Visconti's film, Ludwig, was four hours and was cut uh, down to three hours and when, uh, without the permission of Visconti. And Visconti sued the company. Almost the same happened to Sam Peckinpah in his previous film, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And Peckinpah's response was to hire a killer to kill the producer. That's, <laughs> that's the man. Uh, Emilio Fernandez, who plays El Jefe, if you're familiar with um, Peckinpah's masterpiece, Wild Bunch, he plays Mapache in The Wild Bunch. He was a filmmaker and an actor. He was supposedly the model for the statuette of the Oscar. But he made several interesting and sometimes very good films. The legend says that he killed seven people, including a film critic who trashed one of his movies. <laughs> so this is the word of Sam Peckinpah and his friends. Hey, but, that's why Roger gave it a good review. Yes, probably. <laughs> 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 but he was a true artist. Uh, um, I'm not a huge fan of Pauline Kell, but she wrote a beautiful essay called the nihilist poetry of Sam Peckinpah. And this is what it was about. Mm -hmm. This is a film that starts as an epic. You know, it's incredible. This is the first three minutes of the film, four minutes. And of course, the young girl is the daughter of El Jefe. I, I don't think you will watch the film. The daughter will kill the father at the end of the film. And then everybody dies, as I say. And I strongly recommend, maybe you will be repulsed, repelled, but it's worth watching. It was a completely fiasco at the box office. Uh, Peckinpah was using cocaine together with Warren Oates and uh, also a lot of alcohol, and he died a few years later. But uh, if you see the spectrum of his films, Wild Bunch, Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, Ride in the Hyde Country, I think they're three masterpieces. Mm. You agree with that? I do, I do, and I, I don't think this is available now. I, I would like to see it. But I'm not sure if I'm, I would be completely convinced. But it, I, I just don't know how he got it made. He was completely on the outs with Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. He went to Mexico. He made the film in Mexico oh, uh, in low budget. With, with, oh, low budget. Okay, yeah, well, that, completely yeah, low budget. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he decided, I will live in Mexico. I'm over with Hollywood. But actually, Hollywood didn't want him at mm -hmm. all. So he was forced to go to Mexico, let me put it this way. Now let's go to your third choice, uh, which is, uh, I don't want to anticipate, let's watch it. It's a beautiful, beautiful. So this is Antonioni before he became Antonioni, <laughs> before <laughs> the great modernist of, of empty landscapes and long tracking shots. And um, empty souls. And empty souls. Um, it's from a novella by Cesar Pavesi, uh, Among Women Only, very good, and it's got a, one, a screenplay who's also the screenwriter of some of your films, Suso Chequi Damico. It's a wonderful screenplay. So it's a story. Uh, these are three of the women out of a, f a group of five. Um, Chelia, the, one, the first one, is a, is a business woman. She's, she owns or is 
partly owns a boutique in Rome, and she's come to Turin. It all takes place in Turin, which is important, and I think that was Pavese's yeah. down, and you get a sense of the He was from Piedmont, the city. yeah. yeah. Um, so she's come there to open this branch. She's a very, very self-possessed, authoritative woman. She actually grew up in Turin and is from the working class. Um, um, Yvette uh, Fernot, who plays Momina, who's the one who comes in, who's sort of very um, sort of uh, arrogant and has her way. She, the, all the others, in fact, in this group are, are, are richer than, than Clelia. Um, so she comes in, and then the, Rosetta is the one who's tried to commit suicide, and she revives. And so you have this story of these, um, these women. And it, reminded, it sort of reminded me that in this period, there suddenly are a, lot of, uh, a, a number of films about women on their own in the big city. And you have things like The Best of Everything. I kept thinking of that, where you have these young women coming to a publishing house to either get married or to, to get a job, and preferably to get married, and preferably how to marry a millionaire, how to get a millionaire. Um, in that film, you have these young women, and then Joan Crawford is the one who's a sort of Clelia part, and she's sort of uh, an actual editor and very bossy. And this is usually the way the woman, the authoritative woman, the woman with a good position, the woman who hasn't married is shown as a sort of prune and a grotesque. Not here. I mean, this woman is, is incredibly sympathetic. She goes and talks to the workmen with great authority, and yet she never ceases to be feminine. Um, the interplay among the women is, is fat, it sort of shifts all the time. There's sort of shifting dynamics as they become friends. Oh, I also thought of the Claude Chabrol film, Les Bonnes Femmes, about women, Parisian women in New York. So there's a sense of women breaking free. Um, the other thing, um, people always, I mean, he was, of course, go on to become the great poet of alienation with Monica Vitti as his both surrogate and um, um, and his star and, and and very a very sympathetic figure herself and quite different from Clelia. But the thing is, um, I think this is true. But people always talk about it as a kind of affectation, this anomie. But in fact, I, I want to ask you about this. It's a sort of post-war. They talk about this in it. This sense of a loss of it, the war gave them this sense of importance or identity, and they don't have it now, and so they're adrift. And I think that that adriftness is part of what you get in, in Antonioni. There Antonioni. is also a social element. Clelia comes from a lower class, yeah, yeah. and she enters a yeah. higher class. You mentioned before that this is a film before he became Antonioni. Yeah. Do you like him when he became Antonioni, La Ventura? La I no do very much. But I like this because it has a modesty, and uh, I like Il Grido, I like uh, Chronicle, Chronicle, Chronicle de, 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 Chronica de un Amore. Amore. Yeah. I like all of those, and I do like him. I know you, you, you no, you're I'm a, not an Antonio You're Nipani. a Fellini it's person. A, <laughs> no, yeah, that's okay. No. <laughs> uh, there is a, a moment in um, Ingmar Bergman uh, autobiography called Magic Lantern, mm. where he asks to himself, who is the greatest living director? And he, Bergman, says, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. And I can agree with yeah, that. Yeah. Mm. And they say, Antonioni had some talent, but then he became suffocated by his own boredom. Oh. <laughs> this is Bergman on Antonioni, not a comedian. And I sort of agree with that. Mm. And um, his films are about empty people. Of course, I don't, I'm not so blind not to recognize his. Uh, greatness in terms mm. of vision, in terms of eye, in terms mm. of uh, framing. But sometimes it talks about boredom and it becomes boring. Well, this yeah, I, th I see it as kind of searching, sort of searching for meaning and, you know, and, and betrayal. And what's interesting too, th oh, there's also um, um, Valentina Cortese here. I yes. love her character. She's an artist and Gabrielle Fazzetti is her lover. And she is succeeding. She's got these, uh, she's got these galleries that want her work. And he is just ridden with insecurity, and he can't stand her success. And it's just this really interesting tension between the woman, the, the, the difficulties in a relationship if the woman is succeeding and the man isn't. And of course, Gabrielle Frizzetti would go on to be in La Ventura and play these sort of emotionally stunted men. Um, but she eventually gives up her career in order to, to save his pride. I like what you say about John Crawford. I want to mm -hmm. go back to those films. <laughs> now I have my romantic moment. My third choice, in my opinion, is one of the most romantic films ever made. It's directed by Richard Lester, an English filmmaker. Let's watch it. And I might cry. 
So they have to die in order to have their love forever. Isn't it great? Fantastic. <laughs> uh, this is a film about aging. This is a film about Robin Hood, who keeps fighting against the sheriff of Nottingham, dealing with Ri Richard Lionheart and loving Lady Marian. And when Richard Lester approached Audrey Hepburn, she didn't want to make this film. He said, why should make a film about aging? And then uh, her son say, please make the film. We want to meet James Bond. <laughs> and so she accepted. And I think she did the right thing because it's a beautiful film. Lester is an underrated director. I think he's a brilliant filmmaker. He's English. And he made the Beatles film, Help, and um, Hard Day's Night. He made a beautiful Superman film, Superman number two and many, many other films. And at the, at the beginning, the film was called The Death of Robin Hood, but Columbia Pictures say, we will never sell <laughs> a ticket with this title. And um, even with the title Robin and Maria was not a success, but I think it's extremely romantic and really, really beautiful. And I really encourage you with a, a, an incredible cast. There is Robert Shaw, who plays the sheriff of Nottingham, Richard Harris, who plays Richard Lionheart, and Nicole Williamson as Little John. And if you're familiar with the legend of Robin Hood with the books by Walter Scott, it's, it's really something to, to watch. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there were tons of, there have been tons of Robin Hood movies, but the, the best ones are the 19, I think it was 36, The Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland, and this one, you know, yeah, they're I agree. The, the great Robin Hood films. I think I think that ending it just stands by itself. Uh, I think the film is uh, odd because it's a rip roaring adventure one minute, and so then it's a love story, then it's a rip roaring adventure. But it sort of works, and that's Lester in a way. Um, I love Connery in his non bond bon roles. Totally agree. I mean, wonderful. he was brilliant in the, was. Untouchables, the Untouchables, in um, the John Huston film, The Man Who Would Be King. Would be yeah, King. Yeah. yeah. And I love her when she gets older. You know, I was talking to. Uh, Foster Hirsch has just done this book about the 50s and we were talking about her. He didn't like her at all. And her, I said, I did, but um, she was very important to me at a certain time in my life. She was kind of a tomboy. I love that about her. But I, I like her when she kind of loses her adorableness. You know, there's something so moving. And I mean, although they're in their 40s, so they're not really ancient or anything. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, I think... There's a real chemistry there, too. He was very good also in Marnie. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And when he was, um, he, I don't know if you're familiar with Marnie, the idea of Marnie is that, uh, what's her name, Tippi Hedren. Tippi, yeah. Uh, she is uh, frigid. Uh, it's, it's all about this. And when uh, she arrived on the set and Sean Connery appeared, she went to Hitchcock and I said, how can I play a frigid with... <laughs> And Ichiko responded, this is called acting. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a tradition. Another Lester film that I love is Petulia. Petulia is Another a wonderful film. Yeah. We have a tradition here at Le Conversazione. We end with a comic relief because often we pick very sad films. So it's better to go and close with the laughter. And I had the great privilege of knowing Dino De Laurentiis. And once I asked him, he has worked with so many great filmmakers and many great actors say, who is the greatest actor you work with? And I say, without any doubt, Toto. And this is the same with Toto and Anna Magnani in the only film they work together. <laughs> I just want to add a couple of things. The film is directed by Mario Monicelli. And uh, there is very little that we can add to Anna Magnani. It's like watching a volcano, a hurricane, a waterfall. It's Never seen her blonde. Is yeah. that the only, does she ever do that? Is yes, that the yeah, only I think. Well, Toto, in his face, you see misery and aristocracy, uh, tragedy and irony. It's quite a unique, unique actor. And I agree with De Laurentiis. He was the greatest Italian actor, not only the greatest comedian. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, yes. I look forward to having you back here next Thursday with Michael Barker with another series of Le Conversazioni. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Molly Askell. <laughs>